Hello, this is Pete, King Kong. I will be discussing the novelization of King Kong briefly, I hope. Um, this is another uh, book I decided to get the audiobook of because another title I decided to check out because of the same video I watched uh, uh, from book, book Time with Elvis, Mark's channel, and his round... His his group chat, whatever you call those things, of uh, with his with his with his friends on uh, home on the range, homes on the range. They were talking about adventure books. From that, I previously read Treasure Island, which I enjoyed a lot, and they discussed the the King Kong novelization, which I'd heard about before, and I went to look for it, see if I could get it. This does not count for my hundred book challenge because I already said I would not use. Ow. I would not use audiobooks on that. So this is about a five-hour audiobook. It was narrated by a very famous narrator who's done a lot of Orson Scott Card books, which I will come back to later. Uh, Stefan Rudnecki. He's a great voice, great deep, sonorous voice, perfect for audiobooks. This novel, this version of King Kong, was... Created, of course, for the original movie, which came out in 1933. The book was published, actually, in December of 32. It's based on the original screen treatment by Edgar Wallace and Marion C. Cooper. The This doesn't even show who the author of the book is. Oh, novelization by Dallas W. Lovelace. It's a very good book. I'd seen King Kong before, and I started watching it again today. I found a... A version of it online, but it had too many commercials. So I'm going to look for another version. Um, I remember the movie pretty well, though. This uh, reason I decided to get the audiobook of this, this apparent, this audiobook that I showed you uh, apparently came out in 2005 to be a... to tie in with the Peter Jackson, Jackson movie. It's the original audiobook, but they added some interviews... Uh, from Ray Bradbury, Ray Harryhausen, Orson Scott Card, Larry Niven, Catherine Osario, Harlan Ellison, Jack Williamson, and uh, oh, and a guy, and Mark Scott Zucker, who wrote a book about King Kong. I thought there was one more. Anyway, this book is in, there's a lot of different versions of this because the book is in the public domain because back when. That whenever it was when the copyright laws in the U.S. were different where you had to actually um, where you had to actually intentionally renew the copyright or it would expire a lot of things went out into the public domain which is why over the years various different elements of the King Kong movies have been able to be remade in other movies I thought the book and it I guess it runs about four and a half hours, so it's a pretty short book before the interviews. The interviews were, should I talk about the book first? I thought the book was very well written. I thought it was a very good uh, version. I don't know if this is the first novelization ever made. It definitely is called a novelization on the cover, which uh, if you look back at the thumbnail I made for this, which is the first edition um, cover. It was called a novelization at the time. I, I, don't, I have no idea if they were as popular then. I'm sure they weren't as popular as novelizations would be in the 50s, 60s, or the 60s and 70s. Um, and the actual movie is credited to two other screenwriters based on an idea by Wallace and and the and the other guy um, who who originally conceived the plot so I don't know if they're working from the final script I know many times like for example late in later years when the, like the alien movie by Alan Dean Foster the alien novelization came out he was working from an earlier script so he had scenes that were left out of the movie I think that's pretty common the way this is written is very character uh, based so I had a chance to really live with the characters in this version here uh, read a lot of chapters from their point of views I, I suppose the main character 
besides Kong himself is is Anne Darrow, who plays the the Fay Ray character. Movie starts out a very sort of conventional depression era rags to riches kind of story looks like what they're setting up if you'd missed the title if you're coming in and you'd missed the title you wouldn't know it's any kind of a monster movie horror movie anything like that it starts with this guy named uh, what's his name that doesn't matter uh anyway this guy's this he's like this rough and tumble film director guy and he goes out and he gets all these great uh films by going to actual real locations and filming lions and tigers and bears oh my and he's very acerbic and he's got this boat full of uh crew that they're going to go out and he's got this secret location that he's aware of where it's going to be uh prospects for filming something really interesting we don't get a lot of details at that point uh he needs a girl though i gotta have a girl they the 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 money people are telling me he's got to have a girl in his movies because movies don't sell without romance which was uh, People might find it strange today when we have these movies that that are just these superhero movies where they really don't have any love stories or romances or anything like that. But it was a very important part of the of the of the audience back then was to appeal to 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 both genders and to or to all genders and and to have roman- romantic stories in there so that different sorts of people would so that films would uh, appeal to different sorts of people uh, it was very common back then you know that all of the Burroughs novels which were written you know starting in 1912 or something and c- certainly Burroughs is still producing by the 30s they, they all have romance subplots major romance subplots big deal in there you, a guy goes on an adventure it's usually a male protagonist, protagonist in Burroughs you know, rescues a beautiful princess, pirate movies, same thing. Beautiful damsels, that kind of stuff. And so we have it here. Anyway, this this film director, he doesn't see why he can't just make movies about lions and tigers and rhinos and stuff. But the many people tell me he's got to have a chick. He's got to have a girl. So he's sort of, and he's been trying to hire uh actresses and and this agent comes aboard the ship and says i can't send any of my actresses on this adventure of yours because you won't tell me what the the plot is i don't want to put any of my actors in danger and it's a very frankly unrealistic idea of a of a theatrical agent i would think he'd probably just put his people up for whatever so he can get a commission but anyway so the the film director has to go out and this is where it sort of you know has a little bit of a touch of like a barbara stanwick movie or something like that where this this filmmaker his boat's about to take off he he heads out into the streets of New York and we see the the you know the depths of the depression and we see these people in bread lines and stuff and he's just looking for a beautiful girl who he can hire on the spot to uh, be in his movie uh, which he does rescues her from a terrible situation offers her a job makes her to promise her he's uh, the real deal he's not just trying to exploit her sexually which is what she quite uh, quite reasonably thinks might be the case anyway so she goes on board this ship and I don't know what the story is going to be of this movie this guy is making because he's got one actor one performer Faye Ray and Evero and who's has some experience doing extra work before the depression closed the uh movie studios that were that were running in Long Island and and they 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 couldn't compete with Hollywood and and he's got no other actors <laughs> no writer nothing he's got camera people he's got sailors he's just going to go to this place i guess and you know set up his cameras and look for monsters and then have and ever like scream running away from the monsters or something i don't know what his idea for a movie is really doesn't matter that's just kind of the setup i thought it was very interesting that there's this long setup before there's even any hint of a lost world type situation another thing that's different than kind of other lost world movies where these people are just pure exploiters of the situation they are just going to film and make a movie so they can make a lot of money as opposed to, you know, sometimes they'll dress it up like in the Jeff Bridges' King Kong movie. I mean, the 
the seventies when the Dino De Laurentiis one and the seventies with Jessica Lang and Jeff Bridges on there. He's like a I don't know, biologist, evolutionary biologist or something, and they usually put some uh, sort of ecological bent to it or something in the later uh, giant monster movies. But this is purely these guys are just trying to go to this uh, this lost land film the people who live there film the monsters that they think are, are going to be there and which we know from the po poster are going to be there and just make a bunch of money and go home and and it was you know it was sort of more realistic I think you know there's really a thread in this in King Kong everybody knows about commercialism and exploitation and stuff where the you know, they capture this this free creature and put it in chains and take it back to New York and put it on display. And that's, you know, the real monsters. Play. Who are the real monsters? You know, that always that old trope, which every which is very explicit in, in this movie and in the book, even more so. And Devereaux from the beginning is I hope I've got, I've got her name right. I don't want to call her Faye Ray, though, is very uh, Love a charming character, and she's on this boat alone with all these men, and they're quite taken with her, all of them. And and in a bit of foreshadowing, there's one of the ship, one of the crew people on the ship has a a monkey named Ignatz, I think. Yeah, Ignatz. In the book, it's called Ignatz, and the movie's called E. And and the monkey is obsessed with her. You know, that's sort of touched on in the movie, but it was really more of a deal on there. And we just we see that that. And Devereaux is just this beautiful woman with this amazing blonde hair and but just can't stop thinking about her and looking at her. So it's, it's a nice thread through the whole movie, not just the end where we know that Kong is obsessed with her, but just every sort of, it's like everybody's obsessed with the female, the f femininity of Anne Devereaux. All the, all the dudes are, and it's this very masculine environment where they're like, yeah, we don't want any women here. You know, women are bad luck on a ship and you're going to be in the way. And, you know, and she's, you know, she's a typical plucky, uh, um, plucky spirited, good natured heroine of the 30s of the Hayes Office movies. Uh, this movie was, uh, and the book reflects this movie, the book is pretty risque in terms of, of how she's treated when she's uh, handed over to Kong. Um, you know, you, there's, a, there's a lot of, uh, this book is very dated in terms of its attitudes towards different cultures and different races and women and, and you know, that kind of thing, I think. Probably anybody who's watching a lot of booktube about old old books realizes that's part of it. You can make your own judgment whether whether you want to read it or not. It's it's a very um, thrilling story. The I don't think it's a secret to anybody that it's a retelling of Beauty and the Beast. Kind of. I mean, it's it's a monster who's in love with a woman who. He cannot have the woman, of course, because there's that size difference for one thing, as Harlan Ellison mentions. Um, you know, that's everybody knows that about Frankenstein and King Kong, that the monster is not the creature in the movie. Very, very commonly. It's not a surprise to anybody at this point. I don't think it is a surprise to, to Orson Scott Card, though. Now, so I listened to these interviews. There's about 45 minutes of them, different people. The one that's really great is actually there are two that are really great. The first one that's really great is by Ray Harryhausen, who was the great student and mentee of Willis O'Brien. Willis O'Brien was the genius who created stop motion photography and is really the main reason that people still remember King Kong besides the story. Um, Harry. Ray Harry has when he was a kid. He saw it. He fell in love with it. He, be, he wanted to become a special effects person himself. He ended up working with Willis O'Brien, and then, of course, you know, by the '60s and '70s, Ray Harryhausen was the king of that. Seven Voyages of Sinbad, and and uh, Jason the Argonauts, and all those, and 20, 20 million miles to Earth. All those great stop motion pictures of the '50s and later. 
even through Clash of the Titans, I think in the 70s, uh, Ray Harryhausen was still the man. So, and it's a great interview. You just, there's his voice and you hear his enthusiasm for, for cinema and for making these kind of movies. And, and that was very good. Harlan Ellison gives one, which is typical Harlan Ellison kind of thing where he drops a bunch of names and he's like, you know, he has to get a story in there about how Apparently at the time that Harlan Ellison one is being recorded, I don't know if it was in, I guess it was time, around the time of the Peter Jackson movie, you know, that's why they did these interviews, was talking about the remake. You know, he's mad that people remade movies, and he goes into this whole story about how he almost, you know, like, uh, Randy Newman had to stop me from beating up Guts Van Zandt, ruining... Uh, Robin Williams comedy show because I was going to tear Gus Van Sant's head off for, for his shot by shot remake of Psycho you know okay fine um, he, he and he kind of goes through you know he was, he was uh, born around the early 30s so he probably saw King Kong on his first release something was a, was a big influence to him for Ellison uh you know, he kind of goes through the regular thing, like, hey, it's not the beast, the monster is sympathetic, and what a revelation, which we all know. Um, not a surprise to anybody, except for Orson Scott Card, who is the most obnoxious interview on the thing, and the reason I mentioned the, the uh, him earlier, and since this audiobook is, is edited by the, I mean, is, this audiobook is read by the same person who read a lot of Card's audiobooks, is because I have no idea why they, I guess just because he's famous or something, they, they had this, this transcript of an interview with Horace Scott Card about how stupid King Kong is and how it doesn't make any sense and the, the, the ape is not, not the uh, hero, he's a wild animal who tries to uh, murder a woman and, he's, and Scott Card is rooting for the airplanes at the end and and he's very proud of the fact that he never even watched the movie all the way through, and he certainly didn't read the book. So I guess, you know, it's good to have a different point of view in there, but it would be nice to have a different point of view from there. So, someone who bothered to read the book or bothered to see the movie all the way through without trashing it, so he doesn't get it. That's kind of a, a bummer of the, of the interviews. They stuck it right in the middle for that reason. Then there's this one at the end by a writer whose name I know very well, but I've never read her books, and I definitely want to, and that's Catherine Asario, A-S-A-R-O. She does a really thoughtful interview that goes much deeper into this idea of this dichotomy between be the beast uh, and the beauty, and all the very thoughtful, much more nuanced and sophisticated than the simple sort of approach that you know, that I'm giving it here or that anybody else is. So I really want to make a note to myself to read some of her books because she's very intelligent. And I know she's a popular writer. If you have any Catherine Osario books, if you're a fan of hers, if you let me know where to start or something like that, I'd be interested. So overall, this is a really fun five and a half hours over the last couple of days, a couple listens. And, you know, it's kind of appropriate that I, that I started it and then read the 39 Steps and then finished reading, listening to this audiobook today because kind of similar, very fast-paced. You know, I mean, 39 Steps is obviously just pure action, action, action. This has got more character in it. Um, the writer, who I don't know much, that much about the, of this novelization, clearly could write fiction, could get into the heads of characters, everything you want from fiction. You know, it's not just sort of a transcript of, of the novel. I mean, of the, uh, not a transcript of the film script. It was enjoyable to read on it, on its own. Uh, and there's certain things that are easier or, or better or more satisfying in a book than in a uh, movie and also vice versa. So in the book, even though Kong still shows up about halfway through the book, as in the movie, but the final New York section is very truncated. It's just two short chapters at the end, the last half hour of the book or so, which makes sense because uh, more of that is just is physical action, and some of that and some of that is compressed down 
sort of like uh, Tarantino did in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, very much compressed the violent end of that movie into and just used it in a completely different way when he wrote his own novelization of that movie. Another thing that's very interesting that I never thought of when I was watching the movie before, I don't know if I would now, is as people probably know, uh, the Empire State Building was being built during the filming of this movie. It was not open, it was not complete. If you look at the stills from the movie, if you see the movie, it's the Empire State Building looks different because the top is not on it. It's got kind of like a domed top that the, that the that the monkey that King Kong is standing on, wipe, swiping at the airplanes. Um, and, he, you know, most of the screenplays and the remakes and also uh, the original movie really sort of paired off that this structure in Manhattan, the Empire State Building, is looks like something in King Kong's environment, so that's why he's going there. Uh, it's the Twin Towers in the Dino De Laurentiis movie from the 70s, you know, so that's really te telegraphed in that movie because you see these, you know, you're on this island, this monster island in the, in the Pacific, and you see, like, these two big rocks that look exactly like the Twin Towers. It's kind of silly. Um, so they could have them be attracted to the Twin Towers in the, in the, uh, in the Jessica Lange movie. I just saw the clock on this. Oh my God, I thought this was going to be like seven minutes. Okay, but it's, there's this uh, quite good writing um, in this novel about the Empire State Building and just how formidable it was. It's almost, to do this cliche, the building's almost a character because it is as an imposing a thing to behold for the reader of that time, as would be a giant monkey climbing it just by itself. And they're talking about how, you know, they're looking up at the monkey, the King Kong climbing this tower, and, and it's so far, so high up there that it looks just like an ordinary man. So I, th I, was, I was really uh, struck by that because it shows uh, how, how that structure would have been built at the time and it's really thematically linked to this idea of the you know this young country and this and this this growing um power and all that and this foolishness of these people who who think they can bring this ape back and make money off of it by imprisoning it and showing it off on broadway and i think that's everything i wanted to cover i'm going to cut it short here my name is pete this channel is Bookless Pete, and we will talk again.